If you've got your Bibles, you can open to John chapter 17. We will be there. I was uh, motivated with this message uh, this morning by Monday night prayer. There are a couple of scriptures that came to mind or came out in Monday night prayer. The first one was Ezekiel, and the second was John 17. You might think, wow, that's a, you know, that's a stretch. That's, that's way out. Speaking of stretching, I've promised the cameraman that I'm going to stay on this stage. <laughs> and so you, that's one prayer request right now that we could go ahead and begin to pray for that I can stay in this little area right here so they can get a different shot. But um, that's kind of funny. Anyway, so, so Ezekiel chapter 33, John chapter 17. Now, Ezekiel, uh, the scripture and the story is uh, about an assignment that God gives Ezekiel. And he, he is the watchman. He, he is the one who is standing on the wall. He's looking for the things that, that would come and attack the people of God. And his assignment is, you know, when you see the attack coming, to warn the people. If they don't adhere or they don't respond to the warning, it's on them. If you don't give the warning, their blood is going to be on you. So I, I, I was just, I was taken by that because there was responsibility and expectation from God on the life of Ezekiel. I mean, he, he was in covenant with God, but, but there was requirement of him to walk. Well, when you see, uh, when you go to John chapter 17, in, in, in that particular passage of Scripture, Jesus is about to go to the cross. And it's his last prayer. And he prays for himself that first he would finish the work that he was assigned. And secondly, he prayed for his disciples and the condition they were in. And then thirdly, he prayed for those who hadn't received him yet. And so there's this prayer. Now, what we do oftentimes, especially in ministry circles, is that, that we take this book and, and we see that, you know, John chapter 17, you know, it's the prayer of Jesus, the prayer for the disciples, you know, the prayer for the church or those that are following. And we compartmentalize those things and, and we study them out and we find all their information, which is all good. That's exactly what I'm about to do. But what I don't want you to be separated from is this is a prayer. It's a conversation from God with God. It's one thought. It's a man, God, 100% man, 100% God, having conversation with the Father. Yeah. And, and he's, got this, he's got this heart bent that he wants to make sure that what he was sent to do actually comes about. And so as he begins to pray, what he's praying for is those that are immediately around him, that they would understand that there is accountability and responsibility for what God has assigned them. And then he begins to pray that, that those that will receive me because of them, that there would be accountability and responsibility given to them too, and that they would respond to it as well. And that's the prayer of Jesus. The prayer of Jesus it and all these radical blessings that would come upon you, it was that you would actually accomplish why you were created. It would, it's, your, it's your purpose. It's your, it's your deal. And so, and so um, that's kind of how we're going to get. So to start that, um, let's look at what, what Jesus, just what the Scripture says about Jesus in a few different places throughout the New Testament. I might even go to an Old Testament uh, in Jeremiah as well. But first, firstly, uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 says this, Christ, Jesus, is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. This is who Jesus is. This is the guy who's praying to the Father. The one who is the visible image of the invisible God. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, The Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And He sustains everything by the mighty power of His command. When He had cleansed us from our sins, He sat down in the place of honor at the right hand of the majestic God 
in heaven. In 1 Thessalonians, it's a call to us. He says, he said, for God has not called us to impurity. This is going back to what Brandon preached last, last week, but to holiness. There's a, there's a call on the church to, to do the same thing Jesus is doing. Jesus says this about his mission. He said this in John chapter 4, verse 34. He says, my food, say that with me, my food, Jesus said to them. I'm actually reading from the good news. Um, yours is a little different. Uh, my food, Jesus said to them, is to obey the will of the one who sent me and to finish the work he gave me to do. That was his call. And his prayer is that the disciples would do the same thing and that those who would follow him because of the disciples' message would do the same thing. They'd be motivated by the same thing. That's why Jesus continually says in his word, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will do what I say. You will become like me. So, so there's an expectation. This week I was at the beach. I was in Charleston. I wasn't at the beach. I was way far from being at the beach. <laughs> we were actually moving Doug up here and had a little bit of stuff in a storage facility that took... <laughs> 12 hours to move to another storage facility. So <clears throat> that's not the beach. <laughs> but I was riding around. And, you know, there's a lot of hippies at the beach down there on Folly Beach. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm riding around, and all the hippies are riding around. And there's this, there's this car in front of me, and it's got this bumper on it. And it says in big letters, God save me. And, and I said, wow, there's a guy that's got God saved me bumper sticker. And then I got real close and it said, from your followers. And then it said, and then it said, uh, legalize neutering and spading for stupid people on the other side of the car. <laughs> and I was like, wow, the church has given him a good impression. Now, that could be just a problem with a little bit of cynicism and sarcasm on his behalf, would you say? That might be the case. But I think also the case is that we haven't done a very good job as the church of emulating the Father. You know, Jesus, Jesus, and we're going to see it as we read John chapter 17, he is the, he is the visible image of the invisible God. That was his mission. His mission was to do that well. He was to bring honor and glory. And when you see that when we read the scripture, honor and glory, when he was to bring glory to the Father, how he did that was to respond, to think, to live, and to do. To think, to live, and to do exactly what the Father would think, live, and do. He, he wanted to respond the way God, he wanted to bring glory to the Father by being like the Father. And that's the call to the church. You see, the call to the church is that we would be like Jesus. He has this expectation and this assignment placed on the church that we would bring glory to the Father by emulating him. And he didn't give us this assignment, this task, this, this unrealistic assignment as if he set this, this is a goal I know it's really unattainable, but I really want you to just, you know, do your best. It's just not that way. He thinks that you can actually do it. He thinks that his power working in you can actually be strong enough to transform you if you would allow it to. Because he knows, and this is the end of the story. Because he knows that the only way that somebody's ever going to commit to him is how well you represent him. You see, it's not what you say alone. It's what you do. It's how you think. What you say matters because it should be what God says. What you do matters because it should be what God does. What you think matters is because there's no way to do something without thinking the right thought first. And so God is saying, 
I expect this from you. This is not something I'm assigning you that's impossible, this impossible task. You are to be a human being that represents me well, that grows from glory to glory. Now, the problem with that is, that before we read John 17, is the church has kind of given the message that Jesus came so that we won't go to hell. And that's a true statement. But that's not his assignment. His assignment is not don't go to hell. His assignment is I'm keeping you from going to hell so that you can get your assignment. Right? And that is to be the image of me, to be me to this world. And when you're me to this world, they'll actually know that I live that I am who I say I am. And so do you see why I looked at that bumper sticker and went, yeah. uh, I don't even know that the message, that message has been communicated in the church very often. There's such an emphasis of, of don't go to hell. That, that, that becomes the beginning and the end. But that's not what Jesus prayed for. Jesus Praise in John chapter 17, right before he's arrested, right before it really gets tough. Let's look at what he prayed. This is from the New King James Version. He spoke these words and he lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that you may know him. Now let me just stop right here. That whole idea of knowing God is to intimately know his character and nature. Is to be able to see who he is. To know who he is. What is eternal life? To know and be intimate with God. that he should give eternal life to as many that, as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you. Say that with me. I have glorified you on the earth. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is really confident in, his, in, in what he's done, what he's, what he's communicated, what he's shown the world. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I love the idea and the thought of finishing strong. Je Jesus knew that his final place, his ending place, was going to be restored back to the place that he was before they created the earth. He was going to be restored there. He had to make himself a little lower than the angels to carry out his mission. And at the end of his mission, when he had accomplished everything that he was sent, he would be restored back. Now, you need to see what he says about you and me in just a moment. But let's look and see how he prayed for his disciples. So he prays for himself a little bit, and then he, then he kind of shifts. But it's the same thought. I want you to see that the same thought is woven all the way through. I have manifested your name to men whom you have given me out of the world. He has manifested his name, his character, his, his attributes. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all the things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given to me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Isn't that, isn't that beautiful? It's a beautiful thought. Now, now one of the things that, that I want you to see in this scripture is that Jesus' emphasis wasn't on lost people. And 
we get all messed up. The church has gotten twisted and their whole emphasis is on lost people. And the problem with that theology and the problem with that way of thinking about God is that there's no way to help lost people unless church people actually begin to look like Jesus. So the best evangelism that could possibly take place is that you and me actually start to look like Jesus. And then maybe somebody will say, hey, I understand the love of the Father. I see the love of the Father. I see it in them. I see the nature and the character of God, and I like it. I won't be some of that. But as long as we look like the world and act like the world and claim Jesus, it doesn't bring any glory to him. The only thing that brings glory to him is when we actually are successful to do what he asks. And you can see that that's what he says about the disciples. I pray for them. I don't pray for the world, but I pray for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but these are still in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. You're hearing this? Let them be one with you like I'm one with you. Let them begin to emulate who you are. Let them be the image of the invisible God. That's what he's saying. It's challenging, isn't it? Right off the right off the heels of last week's message. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. That's interesting all by itself. I will not preach on that maybe one day. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. He is leaving. He's leaving us to be the express visible image of the invisible God, expecting this relationship with the Father to grow so that you move from glory to glory, so that you begin to more and more and more be looking like Him because you believe and respond to the Word. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy. I love that. There's a relationship that brings joy. I have given them your word, and the world hated them because of that word. So I don't pray that you take them out. I just pray that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them. How? Set them apart, God. How? By your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that also they may be sanctified by your truth. There's this expectation of Jesus that the same thing that happened to him would happen to me and you. And he didn't pray that you not be taken out of the world. He didn't pray that you'd be taken out of the world so that you're not tempted or bad things don't happen to you. He, he prays that you're protected by the evil one, that, 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 that you have protection. I'm going to go back to that. I'm trying to stay on point. I do not pray for these things, uh, these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. 
And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I am in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. The, the only way the world gets the message is if we're transformed into the image of Jesus. It's not what we say alone. We can talk about God till the cows come home. But if we aren't the image of the invisible God, then people have a, a, a bad point of view toward God and Christ followers. Now, we can't do anything about anybody else. We can do about me. I can do about me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am. That's what I wanted you to hear. The finished product, the end of the story. Jesus says, restore me back, right, to where I was before the foundation of the world. His prayer for you and me, when they finish strong, God, hook us back up. Let them be with me like I'm with you. <laughs> But our goal isn't to sit back and wait for Jesus to return. We should always have our eyes peeled, ready to be reunited with God, Christ because that's going to happen. But we're on assignment. We're left here for purpose. And then one day, we're going to be like Jesus was restored to what was intended from the very beginning. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known you who you sent. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love which you love me may be in them and I in them. A beautiful, beautiful prayer. And then Jesus, Jesus then is arrested. His last prayer. His last petition to the Father. Prophets were on assignment. Jesus was on assignment. God has given those who receive him an assignment. And with that assignment, there's responsibility and accountability. So let's look what we can learn from Jesus' strong finish. The first thing that we can learn, you must be on mission to complete your assignment. If you don't believe, first of all, that you're on mission you're never going to complete your assignment. Now, remember what Jesus said about his mission. My food, Jesus said to them, is to obey the will of the one who sent me and to finish the work he gave me to do. We're, we're fasting. And it gives us an opportunity to think to ourselves, do I value the mission God has for me as much as I value skipping a meal? Or skipping two meals? Or skipping food for a day? Whatever you might be doing, or not drinking coffee, or, or whatever it is, you know, it gives you a chance to measure where your heart is through this whole process. Do I have that same mindset? Am I mission-minded to complete the assignment that Jesus has for me? So how did Jesus complete his assignment? That's a great question. Glad you asked me. Jesus said if people would see the oneness of the Father and the Son, his assignment would be finished. Jesus' assignment would be finished if people could see that those two were alike, that they were same in nature, same in thought, same in deed, same in word. Jesus prays to bring the glory to the Father by bringing glory to the Son. In other words, he, he knows that how he brings glory to the Father is that God would talk to him and that he would be able to empower him to actually accomplish the thing that God sent him for. Jesus prayed to accomplish and finish the task he was sent to do. And that was to bring revelation to men and women of the nature and the character of the Father. End of story. You know, we make Christianity so hard. And the truth of the matter is our whole mission it's to emulate the character and the nature of the Father. That's it. We, we, we get so task-oriented. 
God said, listen, I, quit striving. <laughs> know that I'm God. Be transformed in my image. Learn to love me. Learn to receive my love. Learn to understand my love. Grow in your understanding and the revelation of my love for you. Do you know you, I loved you as much as I love Jesus? <laughs> understand that. Grow in that. Be changed by that. Commit to, as you commit to eating every meal, to accomplish being transformed into the visible image of the invisible God. So we know that Jesus brought glory to the Father by being obedient to the Father's mission and revealing the character and his attributes. He, but, 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 you know, he, he did it again through thought, word, and deed. I, I guess the hard part for me sometimes as a pastor is to, is to see people hang on to thought processes that cannot produce kingdom. One of, the, one of the hardest things for me to do is to watch somebody say, yeah, but, oh, my goodness, you're going, oh, you have no way to produce kingdom until you relinquish that thought pattern. You've got to relinquish that thought pattern, and when you do that, then, then, then something natural is going to happen. The invisible God will bring glory to you because you've changed the way you think. And so when you change the way you think, you actually change the way you speak. And you can't change what you do till you change the way you think and change the way you speak. And so Jesus emulated the Father in thought, in word, and in deed. And so you're called not to be impure. What is impure? Impure is a way of thinking, a way of speaking, and a way of doing this contrary to the nature and the character of God. You're not called to that impurity. You're called to holiness, separated out unto God, to do the very thing that God would do, to represent Him well. That is your assignment. That is my assignment, is to be transformed. I look back at my life. Spent some time with a couple of buddies this week that I went to high school with and college with, and it's, it's humbling. I know you've probably done that if you've gone to a high school reunion or whatever. I, I, I was, we were moving Doug, and we found our yearbooks. <laughs> I was like, wow. You go, ooh. I'll go, ooh. I don't know if you go, ooh, but I go, ooh. And I think, oh, man. Man, how self-centered I have been for so long. Everything revolves around what I want, how I think, what I want to do. I think, oh, God, forgive me. Forgive me. The interesting thing is it's, it's without condemnation. It's not supposed to condemn you. Jesus said, God, God, this love we have for one another, may they experience that love, God. May they see it. May they understand it. May, may that love and that understanding and that revelation bring them to a pray, place of joy unspeakable. It's the joy of the Lord and understanding the love of God and the character and nature of God that gives me the ability to live life in a way that I could never live life otherwise. Let them understand the joy of God. Don't let them hold fast to their own ways of thinking that are impure and not holy. So we know that Jesus said, my mission is my food. My assignment is my food. I'm going to be focused, not what we have for supper. 
not, I wish that preacher would hurry up so we can beat the Baptist to lunch. <laughs> I wish that preacher would cre keep preaching so I can make that assignment my food. Somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> and I know we're in process of doing all this, y'all. I'm, I'm very challenged. And I know we're all being very challenged. The message from Brandon last week and the week before and, and this message to, to move us into a place where God can actually bring revival. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. But first, we've got to know that we have to be mission-minded to complete our assignment. The second thing is that it is impossible to accomplish or stay mission-minded or stay on course without a lifestyle of prayer. I, I mean, if, if you're not a praying individual, if you say, well, I'm just not a praying person, I heard a pastor who fell recently say that about himself, and I, was, and I told friends of mine that I was in ministry with, he's not long for fall. He said, I'm a word guy, I'm really not a prayer guy. You think you can do this on your own strength, you are in trouble. It requires a lifestyle of prayer. And so one of the places that you've got to do to be transformed is you've got to, you've got to begin to get outside your comfort zone, which you have to do if you're going to learn how to pray. Praying is, is humility. You cannot pray without humility. You have to know there's dependence upon God. You, you can't pray if you don't understand the love of God. You can't pray in a place of, of condemnation. If condemnation is heaped upon you, it's difficult to pray. But if you feel condemned, you ought to know that that's not God because the only way you can feel condemned is if you haven't received him and then you're condemning yourself. God's not condemning you. God has provided a way for you not to be condemned. You actually have to choose condemnation, and that is to reject Christ. Otherwise, his grace is sufficient. There's grace and not condemnation. There's favor and not condemnation. And so you, you understand the love of God, and you've got to learn that prayer is, is the course. It's, it, we have to, to stay on course. Jesus prays for himself. Can you imagine the Son of God about to be arrested praying for himself? Lord, Father. I'm almost there. I've done, I've done what we've done so far together well. Help me finish strong. I know the hard part's coming. I know the hard part's coming. Help me finish strong. If Jesus had to pray that prayer, how much more do we have to pray those prayers? God, I'm 30, I'm 40, I'm 50. I hadn't got much time left. I'm 60, I'm 70. Help me finish strong. Help me finish the assignment, God, to be transformed like you. Strongly he prays for all those that the Father has chosen. And you know what he says? Now this, I ain't preaching on this today either. But you need to get a hold of it. You really do. It'll make you relax. Jesus says, listen, it's all your relatives. Jesus says that nobody the Father has chosen to reveal Jesus to will be lost. None. Say zero. zero. What you worried about? Why do we worry? Why are we upset? Why do we stress? Well, so-and-so had to receive Christ. If they're going to have the ability to not receive, that's a whole nother message. <laughs> but you need to think about that. So what do you need to do? I need to be on mission. I need to be showing them the love of God. 
I need to be transformed into the image of Christ. I need to be merciful. merciful. I need to be full of grace. I need to be patient. I need to be long-suffering. I need to be kind, gentle, tender. I need to represent Jesus. So Jesus prays for the disciples. He asks them that they be glorified by keeping the word, that the word is the truth, and they're transformed by the word of God. And, and so as you pray, you have to be praying the word of God over yourself. You, you have to actually have a heart that says, do, do, I, do I look like this? Without condemnation. You've got to be able to say, is this something God wants to deal with me on? How many of you get in our prayer emails in the morning? Uh, raise your hand. If you want to get them, we're fasting and praying, and we're sending out an email every morning. H how about Justin Clark? How, how about Justin Clark? Come on. He's a drummer, and he can write like that. Come on. Drummers? Really? Now, if you'd have known Justin Clark two years ago, you would say about him, no way. The boy never could write that right there. Impossible. But from glory to glory. From glory to glory. Because he subjected himself to the work of Christ to look like God. He's trying to do it here. He's trying to do it with me. He's trying to do it with his wife and his family. He tries to do it in every occasion. He calls you out when you're not doing it. Because he's focused on it. Look what the Lord has done. If you submit yourself and you pray and you know his word and you get it in you, it's going to change you. And so we have to have a lifetime of prayer. We have to commit ourselves to reading the word, understanding it, and then doing it. And there's only one thing. There's only one thing that Jesus prays in that prayer that has some kind of negative connotation and that is he prays for protection I think that's interesting because there's only one thing that can bring revival there's only one thing that can bring revival to our nation but there's only one thing that can stop revival there's only one thing that can bring it and there's only one thing that can stop it the thing that can bring it is unity the thing that can stop it is disunity Jesus knows that you need to be protected from the thing that would disunify you with him. The very thing that would get you thinking contrary to the way he thinks, get you speaking contrary to the way he speaks, getting you doing something contrary of what he would do, he knows that's the only thing that can keep revival from coming to your house. How does it happen? Disunity happens with rebellion. Disunity happens with resistance. Disunity happens when you, when you hold on to your right to be right when you're wrong. And he knows that that's the only thing that can keep revival from happening. Why don't you say that to somebody around you? The only thing, say it, the only thing that can keep revival from happening is disunity. Yeah. Jesus prays that the evil one would be rendered ineffective because the completion of the assignment will glorify God. It will glorify God. And the enemy wants to thwart your assignment. He wants you to be in disunity with the Father. He wants you to resist. He wants you to disqualify yourself. He wants you to come up with whatever excuse he can sell you that you won't come into agreement with the Father. Because he knows that as soon as you come into agreement with the Father, as soon as you're unified with his nature and his character and who he is, then revival's going to come to you and your household. Heaven's going to come. The kingdom is going to be established. Christ followers don't look like the rest of the world. The world hates them because of what they look like if they're not going to receive Jesus. The only way that we can look like Jesus is to be sanctified. 
Jesus says at the end of his prayer, if you'll notice, I'm sanctifying myself. I'm set apart. I've set apart myself to this to accomplish in this mission so that you can be sanctified. So that you can be set apart. I, I'm, I'm initiating the very thing with my assignment that gives you the actual ability to be victorious. So that you can be the visible image of an invisible God. From glory to glory to glory. First Peter 5, 8 says, be sober-minded. Let's read this out loud together. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. He's going to devour somebody. Who's he going to devour? The one who's in disunity with the Father. It's really simple, isn't it? Be sober. Who did Jesus pray for? Everybody that was going to respond to his word. What did Jesus pray for? Oneness. Unity. How did we finish? How did Jesus finish? How do we finish the work that Jesus left us? Only with oneness. Only with oneness will the world ever believe that Jesus is who he said he is. We are the glory of God. The glory of the Father and the glory of the Son. The glory is, is this picture of, of, of being something that brings honor to something else. Hence the bumper sticker. In the name of Jesus, I'm argumentative. In the name of Jesus... I'm short-tempered. In the name of Jesus, I have foul language. In the name of Jesus, I have addictions. In the name of Jesus, I'm emotionally disconnected. And Jesus says, I didn't come for that. I came to unify you and to heal you of anything that's impure. Because you have sanctified yourself. You have, you have treated holiness as if it was your assignment. It's your food. And you said, yes, Lord, to that. So why, why is it we don't bring glory to God? Why is it that we don't honor Jesus? I think a big thing is that the message has been wrong. I think a big thing is the emphasis on the message has been for those that are lost instead of the church. I think a lot of it is that we've had the we've made the wrong thing the wrong thing. You know why? Because pastors felt defeated that they couldn't get the congregation to actually be changed. And so that looked so hard they just wanted to grow numbers. People are tough. We've had people leave the church said, I ain't changing for nobody. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. 
So at some point <clears throat> in my life, this is, I'm giving you what I'm thinking because this is challenging, the, challenging me to the core. Is the assignment like food to me? Is it my food? When I think about finishing strong, I'm 58. When I think about finishing strong, and I think about, well, how do I really do that? What I want to do is I want to put a business plan together. My first thought, let me finish strong. I'll put a business plan together, and we'll go get that thing. <laughs> you all do that? <laughs> and Jesus says, now really what I want you to do is I want you to humble yourself. <laughs> I want you to come after me, and I want you to let me change you. I want you to get where you can hear me better so that you can actually be empowered to do exactly what I say so that you can accomplish everything that I've called you to be and do. And that's how you finish strong. I'll do exceedingly abundantly in and through you more than you could ever think. And in the midst of it, this love I have for you will make you overjoyed. It'll be easy. You won't have to strive. All you have to do is come after me. <laughs> so it should be joyful. It shouldn't be a burden. My yoke is easy. My burden's light. So why is it a burden? Why does it feel burdensome? Because we're resistant. The only way it can feel burdensome is if I resist. If I want to be in unity, When we talk about submission, submission isn't agreement. You see, when submission actually has a chance to do its work when we would disagree or do something different. If, if you could say this, if you could say, if I were in charge, I would do it like this, right? Submission comes right there. Otherwise, you're just walking in agreement. You're just walking. It's easy to walk in agreement. Oh, I agree with that. Let's go do that. No, I don't want to do that. Well, I'm not in charge, so I have to do like this. Oof. I'm going to resist that. Immediately, resistance comes. And we do the same thing with the ways and things. God, I'm not sure why. Because when most of us get through the process, we go, why did I resist God? And so there's, a, there's just natural bent in our fallen nature to resist the Lord. And so I'll leave you with this. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 10, it says this. If then you have been raised with Christ. Say that. If then you have been raised with Christ. That means if you really are saved. That's what that means. Seek the things that are above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, he's already there, y'all. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him. Where? In glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality. Isn't it amazing that's first? Impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked. You once walked that, but you're not walking that anymore when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, Malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeking that you have put off the old self with its practices and then put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of the Creator. Call of the church to be the visible image of the invisible God. There is no way to accomplish that without intentionality. So, 
Let's pray together. Father, I thank you <laughs> that your word's not burdensome. You said about the disciples, Lord, <laughs> you said they did your word. They heard the word of the Father, and they did it. They believed it. They responded. They spoke it. They thought it. Father, in this culture and in my life, I don't know, God, that until this moment that I have ever been as focused on the mission and the assignment that you have for me more than now. And Father, it's not heavy to me. It is, I'm, I'm kind of taken aback. I'm kind of shocked. I'm kind of, I have some sense of sobriety. So I pray against any evil attack that would, that would cause us to resist or to Or to be in disunity with your word or your way. Or God, that would make us hesitate in any way to allow you to do in us what you would have us do. I pray that we not try to be so close to the world's way of doing so that we can be accepted by them any longer. God, that, that your love is more powerful than walking close to the fence of sin. So may we represent you well. May we understand, God, that your mission is that we be the visible representation of the invisible God. That we would love you like Jesus loved you, Father. Jesus, that we would love you like you loved us. You said there's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, that we would understand the goodness of your love. And that, God, because we understand it to such a degree, and we know, God, that we've been forgiven so much and that we received love that we don't deserve, and we understand it so well, that we are actually able to replicate it. And you say when that happens, people will know that you're the Messiah. And they, were, they will know that God sent you, Jesus. And they will be attracted to you, and they will turn to you. And so, Father, may we not worry that you're not strong enough to reveal yourself to everyone that the Father has chosen. May we just respond to you in a way that they would want to be with you now. So I thank you for teaching us. I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for the joy that's going to come as we get rid of the, our bad self. And we emulate your good self. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.